When I was five years old, the best game we had in nursery was wooden colored blocks. Now don't judge, I grew up in the Soviets, but there was only one set of wooden colored blocks and about 30 children wanting to play with them on any given day. And that's what the estates is all about. Not about wooden colored blocks, but about taking your friend's toys away. I won't blame you if you mistake this leaf for a nuclear warning because inside this box there is weapons grade play with three simple propositions or more accurately one simple proposition on three simple streets. Each of these has spaces for four housing blocks to be built but not all of these streets will be profitable and some of them might even lose your points. Have the most points at the end of the game and you will win. One thing you will notice about the estates, which is a re-implementation of an older game by designer Klaus Zoch, thanks to artists Dan and Thies von Paradon, is immediately gorgeous. The colors on the wooden blocks representing the foundational structures of the estates are bright, popping, and make you want to play with them. The rooftops are satisfying to place, and the mayor piece is naturally ridiculous. And for once, the paper money is not annoying to handle, but also manages to somehow be heartwarmingly thematic as your investors within the game are Kickstarter backers that help bring this lovely production to life. Ugh, oh God, ugh. Edward Uller, where have I heard that name before? I think it's my uncle. Here's something you might not realize about this bright and pleasant looking game. It has about as many mean tricks in it as it has pieces. Each turn, you or your friends will pick up a piece, any piece, and put it up for auction, and your head will start spinning as soon as you realize what's inside the box. How many nasty curves are left in this game? You will ask yourself. Spoiler alert, quite a lot. And yes, that's right, I said auction, but let's put a pause on that because we need to zoom out for a moment. Here's how you'll score. Once two streets have been completed, meaning they are full of buildings with rooftops on them, the game will end and each building that has the top lock corresponding to a company that you own will score you points as long as that street is complete. If the street, however, isn't complete, each building you own will score you negative points. Well, that sounds easy. Just don't build on the street that won't get completed, right? Right. Would that it were so simple. When your turn comes around, you can pick up any one of these pieces and rather than just placing them wherever you like, you have to put it up for auction. The person next to you can bid any amount of money that they have, then the person next to them can up their bid or pass until it comes back to you. At which point you have a decision. Either take money from the highest bidder equal to that highest bid and then let them place the piece wherever they like or pay the amount of money equal to the highest bid to the highest bidder and then you get to place that piece yourself. I normally don't interrupt my own videos, but this time it's very important. The No Pun Included Season 3 Kickstarter is live right now. And if you already supported us, thank you, thank you so very much. If you haven't yet, or you haven't heard that it's happening, well, it's happening right now. There's a link in the description. There's an I button popping up somewhere on the screen. Let me tell you some of the really, really great reasons why you should support No Pun Included. First of all, you'll be getting our world famous newsletter and okay, it's not world famous, but people who do get it love it very much. You can get Elaine songs, you can get behind the scenes videos, you can get a Gloomhaven adventure. And did I mention your name on our wall? Actually, there's loads of great reasons to back us, not to mention another year of No Pun Included reviews, playthroughs that we're launching very, very soon and other cookie projects that we wouldn't be able to do, like the What Board Game Is The Song About panel show, without your support, without being crowdfunded. So please consider donating, and we'll keep this thing going. Thank you very much. Back to the video.
I love this. Let's say it's the start of the game and someone takes a blue six and puts it up for auction. Now, immediately there's so many reasons to spend all of your money on it. First of all, it's blue and that's your favorite color, don't argue. Second, it's a six, which is the most points from any single piece in the game. But third, because it's the beginning of the game, if you win, you get to take control of the blue company, which then means that every blue building at the end of the game will score you points. So we're agreed, right? Let's just blow up on our cash. Congratulations, you just made your first mistake. The good news, it's not going to be the only one. Having a big six might feel good because it's six points and it's a blue building and you're scoring it. But tell me, what color is this? building. That's right, as the game goes on, people can and will bid on other blocks and put them on top of whatever it is that you've built, as long as the number underneath is higher than the number you're putting on top of it. And it's only the color of the block at the very top that determines who owns and scores points for the entire thing. So basically what you've just done is given someone else six points and a whole bunch of money to then outbid you. New buildings have to be started in order. And there's another trick. Some spaces are made out of sand? And just like in the real world, people in this game still build on sand spots. They just don't build buildings that are very tall. A sand space can only have a single building on top of it. So maybe when you place that six that you've spent a lot of money on, hey, maybe that's the answer. Place it on top of a sand spot and no one can build on top of it. No one can steal it. And very likely no one will build buildings in that street ever again. Because remember that six in an unfinished street is not a six, it's a minus six. So seemingly there is no right move because you can't just not bid. You have to win things to actually score points. But every move is laden with traps. It's like a shopping trip to Hamley's. As soon as you go in, you realize that you have to buy something, but when you're leaving, you're leaving with an overpriced piece of tat. The answer, as in any good auction game, lies in the margins. The real satisfaction in the estates comes from bidding just the right amount or putting just the right item up for auction or even passing at the right time, imagine the grin on your face when you realize that if you pass on a crucial bid, it won't matter because your opponent will place it exactly where you want to place it. And imagine the despair on their face when they realize what just happened. It is exactly like having your cake and also eating it. Mm. So good. Can we do that? Can we do this take again? Because I don't think I got it quite right. Mm. It would be easy to dismiss this game as just another abstract auction game with wooden blocks, but take my wood for it, the best moments in this game make you feel like Mr. Bad High Rise Daddy, leaving your opponents reeling when they realize they've just been outplayed. It's important to note that this beautiful horse isn't just a one-trick pony. Opportunities for different kinds of deception appear with every beat. For something that feels so strict and rigid, with stark and defined edges, there is a surprising amount of elasticity stretching between the boundaries of what is seemingly possible. Literally. At any point in the game, just like any other piece, someone can put these extenders up for auction, which either extend or subtract the length of any given street. And I can't tell you how distressing, exciting, and uncertain this makes you feel. Okay, imagine this street is full of your buildings that will score you points, but that free space extender is still up for grabs. If you win it, instead of placing it, you can just discard it, you can extend a street, or you can even subtract a different street, potentially bringing about the end of the game earlier, ensuring that you still have the lead. But do you have enough money to actually win it, who and when will put it up for auction? And if you do win it, will that money be used against you later?
I think it's no coincidence that this board looks like a playground with a couple of sand pits. Each time you play the estates, you're not quite sure how it will all fall into place, but you are certain that it will fall into place. And crucially, it understands that the fun part isn't the dorky sandcastle that looks less like Mickey's magical palace and more like a child's unsuccessful attempt at the Tate Modern, but the mudslinging and mess that you made along the way. Or get this, to further the sandpit analogy, you could end up with no companies. Meaning that there isn't a single building on this board that could ever score you points. And in other games, that would be a death sentence. But in this game, it's just another opportunity to engineer something clever. Because you could, for example, ensure that all of your opponent's buildings end up in what I like to call the double negative street. And thus comes the first caveat. Yes, this game is mean, perhaps even too mean, because it can feel rightfully infuriating to have the carpet being pulled from underneath you. But it's not too mean for me, and here's why. This Maya piece is perhaps best at illustrating. Just like anything else, it can be put up for auction and whoever wins it gets to place it on one of these three streets. And from now on, that street will score double, whether it be positive or negative, which means that you can capitalize on someone else's mistake and crush them. It's ruthless. It's incredibly empowering if you're the one who pulls it off. You're the maestro, except instead of waving around the baton, you're conducting this performance with million dollar checks. And most importantly, in the games that I've played, whoever took on that mantle wasn't the ultimate <laughs> They were just the ultimate mastermind. And we all appreciated the performance because we all thought we were part of it. It was only up until the end that we realized we were actually the butt of the joke. And that's the real caveat. You will ultimately enjoy and want to keep playing the estates if you can appreciate not the times when you win, but the times you lose. If you can look up at whoever outplayed you and say to them, that was a good game. And look, I don't want to oversell it. The estates isn't a perfect board game. Your tornado can whittle down to a gastric wind if everyone isn't playing smart. Let's say someone puts up this mayor piece for auction too early. The game doesn't fall apart, but that move feels like wasted potential because it could have been so much more. You need a group of players that are with it, but no one's really with it when they're playing it for the first time. Although they will recognize the potential and after a few attempts, you will have that excellent game. And naturally, there is that moment when one person just takes this game away and everyone still has to keep playing, which can feel deflating if everything's a foregone conclusion. The rulebook suggests playing multiple games together, stringing your scores, but that creates more problems than it solves. And here's the thing, just before we started filming this video last night, I played one final game of the estates just to make sure that how I feel about it is how I feel about it. And it so happened that I was playing this game with someone who's never played a modern board game before. And you might accuse me of introducing a person to gaming with not the right game and you would almost be right. And here's the thing, that thing happened where one person took the game away and it felt a little deflating, but but as we started setting up another game, I found that person looking up the estates on Amazon and wanting to buy it. And they didn't because they saw how much it actually costs. And whilst the box does say two to five, I'd say don't play this with two. I can absolutely see how some people would enjoy the heck out of a two player cat and mouse auction game but you end up looking at this organism through a weird warped prism, and that's not an ideal experience in my book. But none of it stopped me from enjoying this game, and I don't think it'll stop you from enjoying it as long as everything I've said about it makes you think that you'll enjoy it. If you want to learn a little bit more about the estates, I recommend watching a playthrough from Heavy Cardboard. Links are in the description. And if you want an auction game that is a little bit less involved, but still just as zany and unpredictable and fun, I recommend watching our review of High Society. And don't forget to subscribe. 
you always forget. I keep saying it, and you all. Do you know what? If you do it right now, I will never tell you to subscribe again. You're not gonna do it, are you? I just. I'm gonna have to keep saying it. Goodbye.